Thank you all so much for joining me and Director Jennifer Abbott while we chat about her profound documentary, The Magnitude of All Things. Jennifer Abbott is a Sundance and Genie Award-winning filmmaker who has been making films about urgent social, political, and environmental issues for 25 years and has a particular interest in producing media that shifts perspectives on problematic social norms and practices. She is best known as the co-director and editor of The Corporation, frequently described as the most successful documentary in Canadian history, and also has produced, directed, and edited a Cow at My Table, a feature doc about meat culture and animals, which won eight international awards. Jennifer, you've also recently co-directed the sequel to the new corporation called, or I'm sorry, to the corporation called the new corporation, the unfortunately necessary sequel, which we're also pleased to be screening this year. You've been busy. How? How long have you been working on these two projects simultaneously? Well, I, I mean, to, it was it was never supposed to be simultaneous. So I'll tell you that much. Uh, it was more that I started the magnitude of all things uh, around eight years ago now, and uh, was going full steam ahead with with that film, which viewers will have just seen, uh, and. Uh, approximately, I would say six years ago or so, um, uh, the idea of a sequel was being floated around. Um, now, because I edited the first film, um, as well as co-directed it, uh, I was like, oh my God, no, I do not want to make a sequel to the corporation. It's just such a monster of a film. And I, you know, I cut that film from 400 hours of footage. And I, I mean, I'm really proud of the film too. I, I didn't really, I just wanted to leave it alone. Um, and I was also working on the magnitude of all things. Uh, but what happened was, um, for me anyway, uh, Donald Trump was elected. And it was sort of at that moment that the veil came down and there was just not even the pretense anymore that uh, government and corporations were acting independently. There they were rigging the system in front of our eyes. And so I thought, okay, let's do the sequel, which I am really happy that we did. Um, and so that's how these two films uh, became embroiled and enmeshed in each other. Uh, but they're, they're both, you know, multi-year projects, uh, as all my films are. And uh, yeah, I would, I would never choose to, to work on two feature docs at the same time again, if, if, if at all possible. Yeah. That's, that's what I kind of thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I would like to ask you, what led you on the path to producing films that question these social perspectives that most of us simply just accept? Yeah, um, well, you know, I, I've, I've always been a person who has cared really deeply about social, political, and environmental issues. I'm, I'm a real political animal, and uh, also I think I, I sort of see the world that way, which has its its downsides, but its its blessings as well. Like, I I, I don't. Um, like a lot to me, I, I see the social construction of our institutions and know things can be different. I know a lot of people to see the world that way as well, but that's definitely how I see the world. And so as an artist and a filmmaker and an activist, you know, it's a real interest of mine to make work that uh, makes the familiar strange, that questions things that we or many people just accept as the norm. And uh, in so doing, I would hope um, prompt viewers to see the world differently and also perhaps even um, shift their behavior as a result. So it's, for me, it's, it's really um, a multifaceted project that has to do with art and politics and justice all, all in, in one. That, and that's a huge commitment for sure. But I have to say, you know, I might actually run out of superlatives today because I just found the magnitude of all things hugely powerful. And with the power coming from both the intense emotions and the immense beauty of it. And I think that 
Power also comes from telling such deeply personal stories from those who are actually experiencing the devastating climate change as we speak. So thank you for that. I, I can't think of another film that has done this. How did you decide to take that angle? Oh, well, thank you. First of all, thank you so much um, for your supportive words. That means a lot. Um, well, you know, it's funny because I think back on it. Uh, it really, that the moment I had the idea for the film, I do uh, describe in the beginning of, of Magnitude where I speak about that time in my garden where I thought I saw snow falling in July and oh no, it realized it was ash and ash from a climate change related fire. And then, you know, really it was at that moment that I recognized that feeling as grief. And then, then I went, yeah, I, I know that territory. I know that feeling having lost my sister just a few years prior. So that was where that, um, the idea for the film came about but I don't think I thought it through very well because, <laughs> it, I mean, I'm really happy I made the film. I'm very proud of the film, but I just dove right in without really understanding just how difficult emotionally it would be to, to make. I mean, I don't shy away from films that are difficult. All my films are difficult, uh, but this is, is very personal. As you point out, it, it's absolutely my most personal film. And, uh, you know, those scenes where uh, we were filming um, the great, the really brilliant actress, uh, Tara Samuel, who plays my sister in the film, you know, that was the, the house where my sister died. And, you know, going back there and just reliving it all. I, I mean, it, it, it definitely was difficult, but it was also very healing. Uh, and I really appreciate your comments because, you know, for me, film is... Uh, predominantly an emotional medium and you know it's other things as well but it it is I think that and so that it touched you so deeply on that level means a lot and I think ultimately it, it's films that are able to do that 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 resonate the most for viewers uh, and also, you know, this is the first time I've had, um, as a solo director, the kind of budget we had, which wasn't huge, but it was decent. And uh, we really tried to um, capture the world in all its beauty because, you know, and I am really proud of the way the film looks uh, because of course it is, this film is about facing your deepest fears and sorrows about the changing world around us. And you know, grief has a flip side and that flip side is love. And we, we grieve so deeply because we love so deeply. And so you know, I wanted to show the, the beauty of this earth uh, and, and my love for it um, in, in, its, in the way that I, I represented um, various landscapes and, and, and scenes. Uh, so I'm, I appreciate that you commented on, on the aesthetics of the film too. Well, and, and I do think too that those emotions are what really activate change in people. So if yeah. you want to, like you said, you wanted to drive people to, to actually take steps, I think that really hits, hits the nail on the head and it's, it may actually lead people to looking at things in a different way and, and lead to change, fingers crossed. <laughs> and of course, your sister Saley's letters add another incredibly personal element to the story. And oh my gosh, such beautiful words. Were th did she leave these to you as a gift, her letters? Well, she wrote those letters, um, you know, to me and then also to her closest friends. And then I have two other sisters and my parents. So they're, they're written to a, a number of different people. But before she died, she actually did say to me, um, she asked me to do something with her letters. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I mean, at the time, I thought she, I, I had, of course, no idea that it would be this film. Uh, and I'm sure she just thought, you know, a small book or with a collection of photos. Oh, I've lost you. I feel that she would be pretty happy with, with where they ended up. Yeah. I would say so. I mean, it's, it's so beautiful. And so 
how did you actually take the letters and and sort of shape the film around the letters? Because she goes into some really deep, deep conversations. Yeah, well, yeah, so my process is very sort of, because I, I'm very hands-on as a filmmaker, right? So I wrote and directed and sound designed and edited the magnitude of all things. So, you know, I think that if somebody else was editing it, it, it would just would be a completely different film because my process is very, you know, I just sink so deeply into it and I experiment and I experiment and I don't have to, um, I don't have to say in words what I want, right? And so, you know, I think that's the beauty of being an editor and director sometimes. But with Saley's letters, you know, when I start, when I had the idea for the film and sort of started to look more deeply at the psychology of climate change and discovered this multidisciplinary field that existed that I had no idea did, what I saw were uh, parallels with my sister's letters. So for example, the section on hope, right? Uh, within climate change discourse, there is a lot of discussion about the role of hope and how hope can be a form of denial. Right, and also if we if we have hope, we might not, and 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 especially if that hope is not warranted, because if you look at the science, you know it's a pretty pretty bleak scenario. Now I'm not saying things can't change, and I'm not saying we can't we shouldn't do everything we can, but what I am saying is that if you have false hope, it's not going to serve anyone or anything because you're not going to be willing to make the sacrifices needed, take the risks that are needed. You might think other people are going to do it for you, right? So just using that um, narrative thread as an example, you know, we had, there, there's, a, there's climate change discourse around that theme. And similarly, similarly my sister explored hope in terms of her prognosis and her future. And of course, she wanted to live um, desperately, but she also knew that if she had, if she, it, basically, if she had unwarranted hope, it would project her into a, a future place that wasn't completely accurate. And also that it would take her out of the present moment. And so anyway, just to use that one example, and we could go through the whole film and similarly discuss these parallel narratives. And so the way I constructed the film was sort of to, to look at the, the different points of overlap between my sister's story and the climate change story, and then weave those two things together. Right, well, and I, the, I think this came from one of her letters, that deep acceptance of death really equals the acceptance of life. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. to take that a bit further, that leads to the acceptance to face climate change. Yes. And that to me, it, it was like, it still gives me shivers because I find that so profound. It's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, well, I think if we think about it, it takes, well, I mean, there's a lot of literature about this, but we are a death denying culture obviously we celebrate youth and, and getting old is a terrible thing, um, but it takes a lot of energy to push away the fact of our impermanence and the fact of the impermanence of those that we love, right? A lot, a lot of energy. Similarly, it takes a lot of energy to push away uh, the fact of climate science, which does show a, a very bleak trajectory if we don't turn things around, right? And so I think there's those that's there's those parallels, right? Just the energy it takes to keep these things. Oh no, I don't want to see that. Yeah. But if we face our deepest fears and sorrows, right? It's actually for many people very cathartic, very healing, and a huge relief, right? And and so um, you know, people within the that field I discussed, you know, the psychology of climate change, you've identified um, that 
you know, one, and I, and I very much agree with this, you know, one of the reasons we're not making the kind of progress we need to make on the climate front is just because it's so difficult to face. The scale and violence is just so huge. It's overwhelming. It's depressing. It's, it's just, you know, it's, it's just brings out every bit of fear we have within us and rightly so. Especially if you have children. <sighs> yeah, especially if you, and I, and I do have children, it's true. Although I find, I, I don't like that comparison myself because I find it um, uh, like I care about my children deeply, obviously, but I care about other children too. And I care about, I care about the children of the non-human animals out there as well, right? And I, and I, I think I find this culture just so myo myopic in terms of its self-interest. I have a little bit of a reaction and I, 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 you know, why do we only care if it's our own children, right? So I always, I always like to, to point that out. Not that you were suggesting anything of those, that sort. Um, but I think it, it is, um, it is a very difficult thing to come to terms with, but when we finally go towards it, as opposed to running away from it, that's when we're going to make the kinds of changes we need to make and the kinds of different, you know, to turn things around. So um, to me, this dimension of the climate crisis is very overlooked. And, uh, you know, that's why I wanted to, to make a film about it. Yeah. Well, and going back to what Auntie Patricia says, you know, if this land hurts, we all hurt. We are one with it. And I totally, like, I've always been so flummoxed as to why our Western culture doesn't consider us part of nature. And like, taking that notion, it, 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 it affects us tremendously. And I just don't know why we don't see that when it comes to all the commercialization and corporations. Well, I think if it, if it admitted that, it wouldn't be able to like it, the foundations of 21st century extractive capitalism would like we can't you you can't exploit something and have that is other that is not other right and so i think that it's foundational to the modernity project and it's foundation you know that whole notion of of seeing the natural world as other is so integral to our worldview, like a neoliberal Western worldview. That's why I think also it's so difficult to come to terms with climate change because as Ashley um, Consolo says in the film, you know, it asks a lot of humanity. We have to actually question everything we've been told about ourselves, everything we've been told about the future getting better for our kids, for others, everything we've been told about our place in the world, right? It's a, it is a really big ask, but it's one we have to rise to. Yeah, yes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so of course, I'm just absolutely blown away by the fact that you not only wrote, produced, edited, and directed this beautifully cinematic film, but you also did an absolutely gorgeous job of sound design. Oh, thank you. Being a bit of an audiophile myself, I wanted to give you <laughs> the highest compliments on the care you took with it. I, I really felt like I could hear the earth breathing through, through the, the sound and the approach of your film. Um, how, did, how, did you, how did you come to make that happen? And did you also, do the music like I couldn't find any oh. credits in terms of who did the music yeah well first of all I have to say that I am a co-producer so the other producers are Andrew Williamson and Henrik Meyer and Shirley Vercuse of the National Film Board so I have to really make that clear um, I certainly I did not produce on on my own and I and they were all fabulous uh, could the film couldn't have been made without them uh, but thank you for the the note on sound design and also a very astute of you to say what exactly you said because I actually tried to give the earth a voice that I wanted the earth to have um, presence 
And I think, you know, you see that especially in the Amazon where the Kapok tree, which is one of the trees that we shot a drone around, um, the very symbolic and um, sacred tree for the Sapara people. Like if that is a one section, especially for example, where you re I really just wanted the earth to speak and I tried very much to, um, to, to give it, to give the earth a character and to have the earth be a protagonist in the film. And, and sound is so important. I just don't think one can really underestimate. And, and now this is a great opportunity to give my kudos to um, the composer, uh, Rob Law, who is out of Australia. And um, he, he wears a few hats, but he um, is quite involved actually as a climate activist. Uh, and also uh, quite attuned to the subject of ecological grief. And in fact, I found him through an article he wrote about ecological grief in The Guardian. Um, and then uh, he came my way, uh, but I ha happened to be a composer and I, and I loved his music. And um, he, he composed, a, not all, but a lot of the, it's all the credits for the music are all at the end, but he composed probably 85% of the, the music, the track. Uh. It, it's it's just so beautiful and it just fits so well with 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 your editing process as well and you, the way you sort of wove all the different pieces together and actually okay. i just wanted to say one other film and i know you know velcro ripper yeah but with their film he and nova's film right. metamorphosis I felt the same way about their film, about just that hearing the whole, every piece of it breathe. And yeah, well, Velcro, I mean, he um, did the sound design for the new corporation, right? And the, cor and the first film, the corporation. Yes, but yeah, I've known Velcro for many years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, a, he's a really brilliant sound designer. Really is, yeah. yeah. Um, I did, love the way it was editing and so when you like you had so many different locations did you have a plan before you started out how you were going to weave all those together and and uh bring bring them together the way you did like i just i just loved how they just sort of flowed into each scene no matter you know what kind of of scene it was they just melded together so well Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, um, I don't. I mean, I had a rough idea, but for me, uh, you know, documentaries are really written in the edit suite. Most, I mean, other than the actual narration, obviously. Um, and from so, it's it's a very experimental process of, you know, it's a good thing I, I, am quite perfectionist <laughs> and, you know I can spend hours just like trying to figure out a transition uh you know and and I'm I I love I for me the con the construction of the narrative is um one of them it's more difficult it's it's more difficult to like if you look at the corporation films both of them or magnitude you know to actually find you know the the narrative arc both in terms of con content, but emo the emotional journey. And once you've done that, for me, then it's just like very fun to work with images and, you know, all of those transitions between the documentary component and the reenactment components. And for me, I'm looking at movement in the frame, color in the frame, shape in the frame. I used to have like, I. I, and you know, like for example, I'll do things like I know there, like the, I was doing a they never made it in, but one of our producers really loved the transition, and so sadly it got cut. But I actually like flipped an image upside down so that it would match, like the tree was upside down, so that it would an Australian tree would match a, a Nunatsuvut tree. And wow. You could hardly tell that it was flipped upside down, but it enabled for this transition to take place where the shapes matched, right? So I'm just always looking for opportunities uh, like that to to transition, and and I do really love that kind of you know attention to craft and attention to artistry. 
Uh, and it's 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 a much more easier part of the process than I feel anyway, um, the actual narrative constructed <laughs> construction. <laughs> yeah. Do you find do you find that synchronicity often plays a part when you're editing? Like just wow, look at that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess um yeah. That, and that happens in the field too, you know. Um yeah, but I think there's, I don't know, synchronicity is interesting uh, because what is synchronicity? Some, some people, like there's synchronicity all the time in our world, right? And I think it, maybe it's just the way one absorb, uh, observes the world, right? Like if you're an observant person, you can see these opportunities and, but some people might not. I, I mean, we all perceive the world in such a different way. I don't know. I have, I have, uh, I have, I haven't thought a lot about synchronicity. Yeah. Yet. I will though. That's interesting. <laughs> and so, when you were editing, did the music then was that laid in after you you done the editing? Did Rob? No, I I work I work um, with music very early, way earlier than most editors and directors so for example if I'm stuck in a scene like cutting just an interview that does no visuals yet it's just the interview and I'm stuck with it uh, somehow I'll just find a music track and it might be a temp track or it might be the one we use that has the emotional um, tenor or resonance of, of the scene I want to create and I'll just stick it underneath the interview and I'll use that to to sort of unblock my you know, like unblock things. And so I, I often use music very, very early. Now, often that music will change, like it's a temp track, it's called a temp track. Um, and then sometimes, you know, you one licenses it or in, in with Rob's case, Rob gave me a whole bunch of music to experiment with very early on, which I did. And then um, I would cut a scene and then we would have a discussion about, okay, can you can you make this track a little bit more this way or that way, or what are your ideas? And then he'd come back uh, with these other ideas. And um, so, yeah, he he was uh, ex he was amazing to work with. And uh, yeah, so, and, and such a, and the music is such an important part of the film. I agree. Uh -huh. Absolutely. And you had touched on this just a bit earlier, but you know, when you're making a documentary film, of course, you don't know what's going to happen till you maybe get to the edit suite. So, did you? Did you end up with kind of the same film that you had planned in the development stages? Well, I mean, the thing is that uh, that's part of the problem with being the kind of filmmaker that I am in turn. I mean, I actually don't know any filmmakers that completely have a vision for their final film. Other than, I mean, a fiction film is a whole different story. Yeah. Right. And um, it was very interesting to me sh filming the reenactments and working with an actor. And my my twin daughters are actually they play my sister and I. Right. Yeah. I was going to ask if they were your daughters. <laughs> yeah, they're twin daughters. The, the, yeah. Um, and it's you know, it's I, it's so funny because I've always like put um, fiction filmmakers on a pedestal thinking it's a lot harder than but I, it's the opposite. I actually think it's it's a lot easier. Um, so I, I know very few um, documentary filmmakers who who actually have. And I think if you have a complete vision for your film as a documentary filmmaker, well, why are you a documentary filmmaker? Because if it's already in your head, why aren't you just making a fiction film, right? Um, you, you go out into the field with authentic curiosity to, to hopefully discover things that you couldn't have anticipated, right? Yeah. Um, but in terms of pitching a film like this, which is about climate change and cancer, you know, it's a hard sell uh, in a culture that wants to avoid both. Um, and so, but in terms of, you know, how I describe, if you were to read my early treatments, uh, you would, Absolutely, the magnitude of all things is a manifestation of my early descriptions of the film uh, in a lot less detail. Uh, but generally speaking, it's it's uh, quite true to how I originally described it. Yes. Yeah, and it, you you said that you don't know what you're going to discover. So when making the film, what were 
what were the most surprising things that you learned or 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 came to making it? Hmm. Yeah, well, you know, I really um, we obviously went to a lot of climate front lines all over the world. And you know, it's you might think that it's going to be very, very depressing. Uh, being on those front lines, but in many ways it's not in the sense that the people we met just were such big open hearted people uh, with that were showing that showed such resilience and strength and leadership. And, you know, I fell in love with all of them pretty well. Um, so it was very inspiring actually visiting all of these places, even though you know, the Great Barrier Reef is dying and Nunatsabut is melting and, you know, there's all this oil and gas exploration in the Amazon. You know, all these things are really hard, but we know those things are happening and they're really hard. Uh, or some of us know, others like to just pretend <laughs> they're not or, or I should, you know, I, I have to also acknowledge, you know, my extraordinary privilege in terms of having the kinds of education I've had that exposes me to these ideas. And, you know, there's many people that, that, that don't have those same opportunities. Um, so I don't want to put everybody that doesn't know in the same category. Um, but, you know, I think that it's, it's just as the film experience is, I hope, for many people, not all, um, healing and cathartic. You know, it's healing and cathartic to go and visit those places where these terrible things are happening because what coexists in that terribleness is also beauty and strength and resilience and um, just the whole spectrum of, of what it is to be human one can find right there in that location. So, uh, and then, you know, meeting Greta was really ex amazing. Um, and everybody had warned me, oh, she's socially awkward and da, 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 you know, but I didn't find her that way at all. I, I just like thought, holy, she has such a sense of presence. And um, I heard Anna Maria Termonte um, describe her interview she did with Malala and, and just like how this woman just so serene and almost, I don't, I don't want to put anyone on a pedestal, but kind of saint-like, like, just does not care what anyone else thinks uh, and just goes forward with such a sense of purpose. You don't meet very many people like that. So that was also um, really a beautiful experience as was being uh, at in London a week after the Extinction Rebellion shut down the city. So anyway, I had lots of amazing experiences yeah. and, and met so many beautiful people who, who had you know, such courage um, to be so open and vulnerable with us. Um, yeah, so. we had uh, a couple of years ago, we actually had an Ote Tong at Docklands oh. with, with an Ote's Ark. And yeah. he, it, for me, it was sort of what you're describing. I mean, he is, he just has such a presence. He is yeah. just so clear. And the things that he's he did for his people while he was president and yeah. it it blew it blew me away and just what a gentle gentle soul he was i just i absolutely fell in love with him and yes uh, no he he's an, like a, he, you know i you walk into a room with him and you're just lifted up right like you know people but sometimes you're around people that just lift you up and and that's who he 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 also it just astounded me in in just his presence yeah, yeah. I agree mm -hmm. yeah but is it true like I remember when I spoke to him he was saying that the present president mm -hmm. is totally denying and yeah not moving forward really with what he has put in place for his people yeah yeah I yes that was the case uh when we met uh, and I believe it's still the case, but I, I don't know for sure. I, he's still very active, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it, I know that the current, the president that went after him uh, really undid a lot of the things that he did, unfortunately. Yeah. 
you know, I also find your film especially powerful right now here in the pandemic, um, as more people are bringing the thoughts about and the dialogue about the climate change is indeed a major cause of pandemics. Mm -hmm. um, is this something that you came across or, or ascribed to in terms of, of climate change, referring to pandemics? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, and that's a point we make very overtly in the new corporation. So, right. you know, I think that it's a, it's a really overlooked part of the public discourse about pandemics is the relationship uh, between the destruction of the natural world and zoonotic disease transfer, right? And also industrial agribusiness. So um, in the new corporation, we include a headline and it's not hyperbolic at all. It's, you know, stop the destruction of nature or face more pandemics. And, you know, as you know, as we destroy nature, uh, other animals get pushed up against human civilization and have an opportunity to uh, have viruses jump from one species, one uh, the, the non-human animal to the human animal, and sometimes with the intermediary species, uh, industrial um, agribusiness for factory farming also provides those same opportunities. So, you know, there's just this direct link between pandemics and uh, how we are our, our irreverence and disrespect for the natural world. So, you know, who knows what? And then, of course, climate change similarly destroys habitats and does does similar things. Uh, and it's more complicated than that as well, because, of course, um, disease has a relationship to climate. Um, you know, as we see insects go into areas they hadn't pre previously gone because all of a sudden some areas are hotter than they used to be, for example, right? So there's all of these interconnections. What I think the pandemic has shown us is, is our interconnection, which, you know, we, we do not exist <laughs> as, solo, as a solo species. We're, we're profoundly interconnected with all life. Yeah. And uh, the pandemic has shown showing us that. And I mean, on the on a positive note, I think the pandemic in many instances has not all, um, that's for sure, uh, showing us our humanity, you know, that we that we are there, we can be there for us, each other, we can be there for each other, we can support each other, we, we can, we aren't necessarily just these competitive, self interested individuals that neoliberalism likes to paint us as right, we, when you care about others and reach out and um, do things for the group, it actually feels really good, right? And it's very meaningful. So I think, in, and people, know, it's not that people don't know that, but I think that the pandemic has provided a lot of opportunities for people to see that directly and also to see um, the important role of good governance, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, yeah. Because, yeah. Well, and, there's such companion films. The more you yeah. talk about it, the more you realize that that they are absolutely companion films. Well done. They're very different, though, right? Like they're such yeah. different films. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, very very powerful. Um, if you and it, you may not have any idea, but I'm just thinking ahead to maybe future projects that you might have in mind. If there was any film that you could make, no matter the cost or not, no barriers whatsoever, do you know what that might be? Well, I do, I have two. I'm in the process of trying to get off the ground, but I can't tell you. Of course not. <laughs> because course they're not, not public. Of course not. Uh, so yeah, I have two that I, and, uh, but they're, One's an adapted screenplay and the others, is, both are fiction films actually, um, but they're very politically and socially environmentally engaged fiction films. So, uh, but they're in their infancy and maybe uh, I'll be talking to you again in, well, let's say at least two years, maybe five. Exactly. <laughs> these, things, these things take a long time. And now, so, did, yeah. you, did you take on this, these fiction films after you realized how easy making a fiction film was compared to documentary? 
<laughs> yeah, well, you know, I don't want to, I mean, I think making no. a really amazing fiction film is obviously very difficult and challenging. I just, what happened for me was sort of, oh, wow, there's some really, um, there's some things within fiction filmmaking that are actually easier than in documentary filmmaking in the sense that, oh, wow, you have a crew of 20 people. Well, that's just an independent film. If it's a bigger film, it's more, of course. Um, or you can, oh, I can do 20 takes of the same scene, or, you know, <laughs> I can bring in the equipment I need in advance and know, you know, I want this, you know, there's just so much more planning. And then of course, editing, uh, you have your screenplay and, everything's already laid out the way the film is supposed to go, right? And so editing is just a completely different thing when you're editing a fiction film. But I don't, I don't want, you know, I don't want to misrepresent that at all. It's just that there were things that I didn't understand um, how much, you know, the whole film production process um, in terms of fiction filmmaking, uh, some of the things that make it a lot easier than doc, you know, documentary, you're just always on the fly. You're, you're um, never quite know what you're, you're going to um, run up against. Uh, of course, your interview subjects, you you know, who knows, it's all, it's just so many, it's a big mystery. And, and I mean, in that way, it's sort of fun, but there's just these huge differences. Um, but I'm, I wrote a screen, I have written a screenplay, which I really loved writing. And uh, uh, it was so fun to write because it's it's sort of an, a bit of an activist fantasy um, story. And, and it was just like, oh, I just can make up whatever I want to make up. So uh, I, I've kind of been going in the direction of um, fiction filmmaking for a little while. And I, I don't think I'll ever fully abandon documentary, but I, I am really interested in pushing documentary as a form and um, and also just seeing what happens um, as I sort of explore fiction filmmaking a little more. Well, I certainly hope you don't give up documentary filmmaking because this is, the magnitude of all things is exactly it. It is, a, a magnitude of a film that that um, I think oh, thank you. can just be uh, something that a lot of documentary filmmakers could can sort of look up to. I think Jennifer, it's just an exquisite film. Oh, thank you. That's a, that means a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here, and thank you for sharing your thoughts and your personal experience in creating this unique and absolutely beautiful climate change film. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you to Docland for, for hosting um, The Magnitude of All Things, screening it online. And I really appreciate the support and your questions. And Pleasure. And I don't, know, I don't know if Jane told you this, but we are actually, it's going to end up, if health regulations don't change, we're going to have an in-theater screening of it in the Rafael oh. Center in San Rafael. Oh, I didn't know that. You mean now? Like, it, yes. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. That's yeah. Great. That's that, yeah. I had. I couldn't believe that I was going to have the opportunity to actually show this to our audience on the big screen the way it really needs to be seen. So. Oh, that's great. Well, it will be. Uh, I think maybe the fourth time it's been shown on a big screen. So that's great. That's re and I. I'm really happy. And it. You know, it's all shot in 4K and. It, it, I, I love how it looks on the big screen and I, I can't wait to see it on a big screen myself again one day. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you yeah. too all out there in cyberspace for joining us and to all our sponsors and donors. I'm so very grateful to all of you for helping keeping Docklands alive and kicking through this very challenging year. We couldn't have done it without you. Please do take in all the films. And as we talked about today, you won't want to miss the new corporation as well. And uh, until no May 16th, so you've got plenty of time. We owe so much to documentary filmmakers. They add so much to our worlds. And I truly believe that most of what I know I've learned through documentary film. So thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you everybody um, for taking the time to, to screen the film and to attend this event. Thank you. Take care, stay safe, stay well. You too.